Ladies and gentlemen, can I begin by welcoming you all to this, the seventh in our series of Westminster Faith Debates. My name is Charles Clark. I have many manifestations in my life. The current one is visiting professor of politics and faith at the University at Lancaster, in which capacity I've worked with Linda Woodhead, who I'll introduce in a moment. So it's been a tremendous series, which I've been absolutely honored and delighted to be associated with, really because as a result of my time in office, as Secretary of State for Education and Home Secretary, I became acutely aware of the importance of religion in our society and the need for us to think more clearly about what role it plays in society and how we could address things in a better way. But the first time I really thought that this might work was when we organised a question time event at Lancaster University just over a year ago now, and it was on the theme of politics and religion. And in the first half, I asked questions about politics, and it was absolutely fine. But in the second half, we had questions about religion, and the audience just came alive at that point. And I thought, hmm, maybe it'll be okay. So we decided to go for it. We set up a full series of seven serious debates about religion. I actually knew we had to stop at seven because I'd run out of outfits by then. I have had <laughs> returned to my, my first one here. I'm going to start things off by asking the first question. And actually, it's a question for all three of our guests. It goes first to Charles Moore. Those of you who have been in our previous debates will know that some of the speakers, I'm thinking, for example, of Bishop Michael Nazir Ali, believe that religion has been pushed out of public life, marginalised, even persecuted. Other of our speakers, like Richard Dawkins, think it's not been pushed out far enough. It still has undue influence in government, schools, and so on. So, I'd like to ask you, what is your view of how well the UK currently does religion in public life, and what improvements do you think are needed? Charles. One thing that we in the media tend to find frustrating about um, organized religion in this country when we're trying to report it is that, that the more organized the religion is, the, the less keen it seems to be on clear communication. And um, uh, I think there's a sort of embarrassment about encountering the modern media, which is very understandable because we are terrible, but um, uh, is also a great loss because uh, Christ says uh, in what's called the Great Commission, go ye out in the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And, one of that, and that is, among other things, a great media uh, mission. And so it was from the beginning, and you could say that the four Gospels are, among other things, uh, marvellous pieces of extended journalism. I'm still trying to work out what particular media outlets would be sympathetic to the four Gospels at the moment, but that's perhaps a rather longer question. Um, I want to come at it from a slightly different angle, which you touched on, Charles, in your last remarks, speaking very much from the point of view of the Church of England. I think the position of religion in public life is not obviously just a matter of column inches or whatever. I think it's very much how it works on the ground in localities. That's where I, I start thinking about it. Last weekend, I spent in, in Gloucestershire on a pastoral visit to the diocese, and on Sunday morning was in Colford. Some of you will be aware that the appalling killing last week by a father of his three children was a Colford family. So I had the opportunity of seeing on the ground what the church was actually capable of doing in a deeply traumatized community. It remains true in ways that are, I think, very surprising to some who only come at this at second hand. It remains true that the church is where people want to put a lot of their emotion, a lot of their otherwise unmanaged feeling and suffering. It struck me a lot in the last couple of years how very, how very many faith-related or faith-based development agencies there are, not at all exclusively directing their attention to members of their own faith, but able in many circumstances to work very effectively together because they have the grassroots access. And I believe that's something we ought to be working to promote and deepen myself. I think the way I would look at this question is this. For, for, for some people, 
they feel that religion should be shoved out of the public debate altogether. And, you know, there are many eminent philosophers, John Rawls amongst them, who would say you really should not be able to advance the argument in the public sphere based on your faith. Um, and then, of course, there are others who would say that religion should be able to determine the outcome. Now, as <laughs> it's perhaps a rather a parody to talk about it as a third way, but I would be... Uh, what I would say is this. I think what we need is a combination of what I call um, religion-friendly democracy and democracy-friendly religion. And what that means, I think, is that people within our democratic space accept that people of faith are, um, have the right to articulate their views and articulate them on the basis that they're driven to do that by their faith. And so it is, a, in my view, completely justifiable for people to advance a particular point of view on particular issues of the day and advance that view because they feel impelled to do so as a result of religious conviction. On the other hand, I think it is in the essence of democracy that it is pluralistic, um, that those people who advance that view, even though they do so from deep-rooted religious conviction, have to accept that the views of others, including non-religious people, are equally valid. And we have all to accept that there is a common space, um, and in that common space, we agree that we ultimately decide this through the proper processes of the law. Uh, it's Parliament and the, the courts. The one of the reasons why I think this is so important is that out there in the rest of the world, particularly in, in the Middle East, where I, I spend a lot of my time, um, they are now moving towards democratic systems, which is great and valuable and long overdue. On the other hand, it is very important because of the power of religion in these societies that we do articulate what the right relationship is between religious faith and democracy so that people feel that their faith is safeguarded and allowed to play its part, but also that they understand that there is, in the end, something essentially pluralistic about the concept of democracy, which means that religion should have its proper place, but in the end, the processes of democracy must be supreme in the ultimate decision-making. Well, thank you very much. Of course, um, you spoke of Parliament and the courts, and I expect most people here would, would say that you're right, that Parliament and the courts should decide matters in, in the public sphere. But one of the problems that believers have uh, now is that Parliament and the courts have passed a lot more things that are highly hostile to what they believe. And this isn't only in particular subjects, it's actually systematic because it's to do with the idea of universal human rights as, as interpreted by essentially secular judges. I see the extent to which people of faith feel victimized or marginalized. I'm not sure they always see it clearly. I think that a few extremely difficult areas and a few extremely hard cases have created a, a slightly um, highly colored view of, of where we are. I think the challenge is to reconnect the discourse of human rights with some of its own religious roots, because I'd say boldly, there wouldn't be a discourse of human rights unless there had been a theology, because the notion that human beings have innate dignities, all human beings have innate dignities, is, is not a self-evident one. It's not one that just comes from secular sources, as a matter of historical fact. I'm just a little wary of jumping too quickly into the victim posture here. Um, as a matter of fact, we have, as religious communities, we have access to the public sphere. As Tony has said, we can be visible and audible in public discourse. And I would say that over the last, I don't know, the last decade or so, the recognition that religious motivation is really significant across the board for an awful lot of people has made it perhaps a little bit less disreputable to talk about some of these things in public than once it might have been. I think one of the things that, that helps the system to work in this country is, of course, partnership between the state and religious communities, including the churches, which means that the churches or other religious communities are not free simply to set their own standards in such schools. They have to comply with what the state requires for the basic elements of education. That's good, I think, on both sides. And so long as that partnership is there, it means that there is a sort of joint responsibility 
for standards. <coughs> the state recognizes there's a legitimate role for religious communities. The religious communities recognize that they're not allowed just to opt out of everything. And that, that's a bit of a key, I think, to how it might work in other areas. My name is Gareth Wallace. I'm the policy advisor for the Salvation Army. Um, just today, the churches have been speaking out about gambling and the government's uh, gambling legislation, which Mr. Blair's government passed. So I was wondering if he could reflect on how his faith influenced how that came about. I knew this would get tricky at some point in, the <laughs> in these proceedings. Um, you know, my attitude on gambling is, fits in exactly with what I've said. I mean, I didn't, frankly, agree with the Salvation Army's position on it. Uh, the reasons I gave at the time, which is that, that people could gamble online, there's all sorts of ways they could gamble, and therefore I didn't think it wrong to prevent people um, setting up these casinos, and I s still think I'm afraid that was the right position, with apologies to you for speaking my mind like that. Um, but, you know, I think that's a classic example of what I'm saying. I, I think that you, you should be absolutely right to stand out there and say, we believe this is a moral issue, we believe you're wrong to do it, as long as you understand that in the end, I as Prime Minister should take a decision on what I genuinely believe to be the interests of the country. Looking back to that um, notable afternoon in the Lords where I, I was one of the bishops who voted, I put my hand up on that because I did think, saving your presence, that the idea that you could regenerate an impoverished area of Manchester by importing a super casino seemed to me utterly, utterly bizarre. Um, and, and I haven't changed. I haven't changed my mind, but, but it seems to me that the kind of argument we had on that occasion was one where it might well be quite important to say at some point, well, I'm saying this because of who I am, where I'm coming from, but the details of the argument have to be addressed in pragmatic as well as broad moral and ideological terms. And that's true, I think, over a, a range of issues. It's certainly the way in which a number of discussions about assisted dying have gone in the public sphere. In other words, I may come at it with a, a strong set of religious convictions which actually dictate my view on this. If I have an argument about this in the public sphere, I can't expect somebody else to accept the authority of where I start from. And I have to be a bit bilingual, let's say, in, mm -hmm. in that. One of the things that's very, very annoying about public policy today is that the people who make it don't understand that all these questions have been debated before. And, and religion has been debated, debating them for literally thousands of years and has developed a wisdom about it which is applicable to, to some extent to everybody. And so in the question of gambling, it's very difficult to know exactly what law you should make or not make. But it is a very important point that gambling is a very dangerous activity for human beings. And my goodness, we're seeing that in the banking world today. Um, and if you have in your head this religious knowledge and religious tradition, it informs the debate so much better. I'm Rabbi Laura Jana Klausner. I'm the rabbi to the reform movement. And uh, you talked about religion having looked at many issues for years and years. But the issue that seems that's not being risen, raised tonight is the issue of women clergy. So I'd love to know if there's something new that you've discovered recently in the debates. I think most of the arguments about women clergy at every level have, have been had in the last 20 years and more. And I wouldn't have expected a great deal new to emerge at the level of argument. What I think is emerging is a couple of things. One is certainly the last round that we've had of discussion in the Church of England. I think the bishops, have, myself included, have had to learn just how difficult it is for women to hear an all-male body pronouncing on their future. Even with the best will in the world, the bishops making the suggestions they did because they wanted it to happen, and yet somehow that communicated itself in, in a problematic way. Um, I still think, myself, that we, we had the right general idea, but that's not going to make much difference to those who heard it as offensive and problematic. And that's just a, you know, a general reminder that we are now in a church, as we're in a society, where we expect to hear from people and expect people to be able to say where, what they're feeling about issues as well as what they're thinking, 
and to be heard and taken seriously and to get a, a fuller, more collaborative discussion. Um, my name's Paul, I'm from Brunel Psychology. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, it's, it's a personal thing really about uh, reconciliation, not, not in the religious sense, but how, um, given all we know about uh, modernity, the modern life, the advances we've made in uh, science and technology, how you can reconcile this with uh, some central tenets of your religion, which I believe involve um, a lowly carpenter's son 2,000 years ago rising from the dead, and you know, a process which is physiologically impossible. For me, the resurrection in the sense of, of um, someone reborn is, is a very important, indeed essential part of the Christian faith. But it, it is where um, you, I think, would have to, have to accept that that is what people who profess the Christian faith believe is a matter of their faith. And um, I think what's important is to understand why we do the context in which we understand it, what it means to us. And, you know, this is a, a debate that I had from quite an early age, since my, my father, although I, I'm a Christian, my father is, was and remains um, a militant atheist. Um, and so it's a debate I'm well familiar with. But I think rather than try and see this as a debate about um, physiology in some way, or, or, bi or biology, just to see it as a, as a debate about what our faith means to us, and what it um, tells us about the human condition, and how we rescue it from um, the very great difficult circumstances the human condition finds itself in. So I would look at it, at it in that way, and I think if you approach it less in the method of a um, sort of laboratory experiment, and more in the, in the method of a, a, a conversation about emotional connection and what it, what it means to us to be a Christian, then I think you maybe have a better understanding of why we believe it and why it's so central to our faith. Jeremy Paxman scornfully asked you whether you prayed with George Bush, um, but why would it have been wrong if you had? Wouldn't it have been a good thing? Well, perhaps you did pray. Did you pray with him, in fact? It wouldn't have been... <laughs> It wouldn't have been a, a wrong thing, it's just that it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure as a journalist you understand the distinction. Do it next time. <laughs> 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 Touché. Um, the... <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>